Good morning. Um, Oleg, how are you? Hi, Richard. Hi to all. Oh, hi, Alp. Uh, you know, I had a traditional <laughs> traditional program issue, and I have heard your voice maybe two or three seconds. Uh, I heard you said Oleg, and I traditionally felt uh, being very happy at that moment. So, uh, yes, yes, very happy. Traditionally, I was waiting for this for two weeks, a long time for me for such an event. Um, so, uh, we had a snow hurricane, hurricane here, snow storm, uh, and uh, I like storms from my childhood because, um, and maybe it's one of the reasons why I became a transformer. I like stormy conditions. So, so I feel very happy. And uh, I was waiting for two weeks and especially very happy today that I was waiting longer than always. And now I am I take part, part in this, our trend following trade and ideology discussions. So, so here is my mood and my point. Very good. Yep. Sorry I missed uh, last week. I was out in Colorado skiing. And I just could not cope with the time change um, and the kids running around the house and the wine that I had drank the night before. So I thought I could do it, but I'm sorry I missed last week. <clears throat> um, so we obviously, uh, uh, there's a lot of stuff going on this week in the markets and in Twitter. I got obsessed with Richard's Top Traders Unplugged with Niels and tried to listen to as much of that as I could. I wasn't able to quite finish it, but I had listened to it once or twice before, and there's a lot of great stuff there, and hopefully we can uh, get some more information and clarification and a follow-up from Richard on all of that. It's really good stuff, but a lot of stuff going on as well in the other uh, debates, Alp and uh, Absolute and Richard, some of that. I was too busy to follow. Um, but anyways, uh, I'll start it off just by seeing if Richard will have a go at um, trying to formulate some questions on his podcast with Niels. And I can't really remember, I'm not really that prepared this morning, but I can't really remember, but it was, I remember thinking um, that I didn't really fully understand the way that Richard was describing his back testing process, where um, unlike the rest of us who do the back test and try to pull out a, an approach, a breakout chandelier or moving averages and then the parameters and all the other things that go with creating a, a strategy or systematic strategy. And um, so, but Richard sort of described his way a bit different, where it's not so much what he gets out of it, it's what he, um, mm, I'm already lost. It's not what he gets out of it, it's what he leaves behind or what he decides not to take from it. Yes, what he, I think it's what he decides not to take from it. So maybe he could just recap that. But here's my big question. Um, he knows how I do it, he, for sure. He absolutely knows how he does it. And he describes it a bit different. However, my question is, can, can you um, give us an example of how you and I, for instance, as an example, would come up with a different parameters or a different uh, solution set? Or is it just sort of philosophy and we would both probably come up with very similar, if not the same, results and agree with the results. Yeah, so that's where I was a little confused. G'day, Jerry. G'day, everyone. Great to be here. Um, yes, Jerry, so I suppose the way I view it, and I actually think it is similar to the way you do it. Um, you mentioned um, a few uh, spaces back how the way you undertake your back test is um, you don't run it over all the data. What you do is you um, look through your historical data and you identify the outliers in that historical data. Then what you do is you say, right, 
what sort of um, what sort of parameters, variables do I need in my simple strategy to catch um, the majority of that outlier? You're not really worried about the rest of the data. That's effectively what I'm doing as well, and I refer to it as a process of exclusion. And what what I'm meaning there is that when people undertake back tests, um, this is um, this is gen generally for people that are not trend followers. When they undertake back tests, what they're looking for is um, signals in that price data um, that um, have a characteristic signature. Um, so, you know, a convergent trader is looking for a particular characteristic repeating signal that occurs in that price data. Um, but that's different to what a trend follower does who's targeting outliers because these outliers are these exotic anomalies which don't have any sort of predefined character. They, they, they can be very various in form and shape and outcome. So we need a different process to what um, most people do when they're doing a back test. And most people, what they're trying to do is they're trying to um, interrogate a price series and look at some characteristic in that price series that's repeating. And, and um, they're looking at a frequency and they're looking at an oscillation, which creates a, a particular pattern that repeats on into the future. But uh, I don't do it like that. So I'm working on the principle that um, the general character of most price series is reflected um, through a normal distribution. I'm saying that... Um, the bulk of the distribution, you know, 90% of the price data carries with it these, these signals that give people the ability to extract opportunities from the arbitrage in those signals. Now, I'm saying that they're fairly weak signals. It's a fairly efficient market. And I'm saying that the particular signals that we are trying to exploit is the, the 5% that don't fit within that the bulk of the distribution. So the way I therefore use my logic to interrogate a price series is I'm using a back test as a way to exclude that 90% of the data, which is different to another, you know, convergent trader who is using their back test to include that 90% of data, because that, that's where the majority of their edge is driven from, the, the bulk of the distribution. I'm saying I'm using it as a method of exclusion. Does that make sense? Yes, um, but I'm still sort of wondering, um, are we going to come up with different um, parameters and different lookbacks and that sort of thing? I, I do think that um, one of the things that is very different from... Our, my philosophy, the way I was taught, you know, is that, um, oh yeah, and we've we've talked about this a lot, and it's um, just interesting how it's so different, and I, and I do agree that it's, I'm anticipating that um, any sort of difference doesn't really yield much of a strategy change. We're both kind of long-term trading all the markets, and we kind of talk about it, I think, in, in a different way, but we probably come to almost similar conclusions. Um, now, and this is this whole idea that, um, oh yeah, this is a real turtle thing that you totally, absolutely do not agree with, which is, which is good. I mean, that's the whole point of, to a large degree, of uh, spaces and learning and enjoying this debate. Um, and so, and this is that, uh, I think you go on to sort of um, talk about this in your own way. And this is this idea that the applying the parameters to 5,000 trades, we, uh, we get obsessed with this sample size. And thus, the one entry, one exit, and the stop loss to sort of maximize that sample size. And within, the, within that sample size, and you talk negatively about um, – the sample, yeah, the sample is not good. It doesn't. It's going to change. Uh, the correlations are going to change. Um, but but we extract from the, this five thousand trade sample size um, some uh, not predictions, but we definitely think okay, the expectation per trade is this, the average win, the average loss, uh, the win percentage, etc., the trade stats. Okay, so. We, we go, go forward comfortably and confidently with 
this sample size. This is what it's all about. And the managed futures guys, they're no, they don't even, they're so far not caring about sample size. Jerry, you can keep talking about it, but we ignore it. Okay. So we look at this sample size and with all these trades, you know, and we say to ourselves, oh, look in there. That's interesting. 5% of the trades make all the money. And we, but we ignore that as it relates to invalidating somehow that would kind of minimize or validate or put an issue of this 5,000 trade sample size. Close your eyes. We trade all the markets the same. It happens accidentally. We look up and the samples, it's 5,000 trades, but because we treated every trade the same way, with the same parameters, we can include those 5% outliers in there and claim that as confidence and robustness for the future. But then you come along and say, no, no, no. Um, all of this performance is dominated by those outliers. Thus, there's nothing in that sample size uh, that's really good for the future. Things are going to be much different. We're not predicting expectation. Uh, the sample, we, we absolutely must segregate this 5% away and acknowledge that they're so different than the other 95% that we really can't rely upon this typical statistical measurement of sampling. What do you think? Well, I do think sampling sample size is important, but this is how I view sample size. So when I talk about a single return stream, so let's say we have a single strategy applied to a single market, and we might have a, a 30, 40 year data history of that single market. I'm saying that the number of outliers or the number of signals that we are addressing in that 40 year data sample might only be you know, 10 trades over that entire period. That's one return stream. But because we treat all of, our, uh, all of our markets the same way in the way we trade them and our systems the same way in the way we trade them, we can massively increase our sample size under the, under the appreciation that a single market is not our sample size. Our sample size is reflected by our diversified portfolio. So with my diversified portfolio now this year, I've now gone to 70 markets with 15 systems. If you multiply that out, 70 by 15, I get a massive sample size, but when, uh, so I might get 11,000 trades over a 30, 40 year period um, on my testing. But when you break that down and you, divide that 11,000 trades by 70 markets by 15 systems, you see that you're still getting about 10 trades per return stream, but you've got a massive sample because you're treating all of the markets exactly the same way. And this is because I believe outliers are a universal phenomenon found throughout any liquid market data and we are attacking a universal principle, which is different to a convergent trader who is looking for a characteristic signature in a single market. That is totally different to what we're addressing. We're addressing these outliers, which can be found anywhere or anywhere within any liquid market. They are universal because we know that when we undertake a, um, you know, a, an assessment of the distribution of market returns on any of our liquid market data, we find that over a long-term sample, they all have this leptokurtic tendency. They all have tails. So that's saying that the tails is actually a universal property found within all liquid markets over a very long data sample. So we're applying, we're attacking a universal principle. We're not attacking the edge that resides in a characteristic signature of an individual market. And that's why our process requires extensive diversification to attack this universal principle. And that's why that's the whole modus operandi for, for why we are trend followers and why we diversify. Uh, I like the idea of, uh, of this <coughs> being uh, to have a solution, non-linear non asymmetric solution when uh, you reach but a Richard, service. Can I ask you something? Uh... Isn't it so that the, the guys who are after convergent strategies are also after a universal principle, in this case, mean reversion, instead of the characteristics of any of the singular 
um, return streams that they follow. For example, guys who sell volatility say uh, they 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 guess they bet that volatility goes to extremes and that go goes back. So aren't they also going after a universal principle? Mean reversion is a universal principle, but this is a big difference. When people are applying a mean reverting strategy, they can't have a one-size-fits-all solution for mean reversion because the equilibriums are going to be different in each of the contexts. The standard deviations away from that mean is going to be different in different contexts. They've got to apply a concentrated strategy for each of their return streams. They they can't apply... It's it's against, um, it's against logic that they... they they are forced to adopt a concentrated strategy as opposed to a diversified strategy because they're, they're um, assessing statistically the price series that they're, they're targeting with their convergent or mean reverting strategy. And they are therefore fitting their strategy to the equilibrium properties, the standard deviation away from the mean for that individual market. They then can't apply that same those same variables that we do to another market, to another market, to another market, to another market, because the properties of that mean reversion is not universal. It's different, but it is mean reversion as a general principle is applicable across any market, but they've got to basically fit their strategies to the characteristic signature of an individual market, which requires a concentrated strategy. But you say that the, the parameters are different. For example, say a guy who sells insurance, right? You say that he cannot apply a universal principle of saying, I'm going to um, uh, sell insurance for an X, uh, X uh, skewness or X uh, out of the money um, uh, strategy, no matter what, what do I have uh, underneath it. For example, I will sell X under, uh, for example, I will sell for S&P, for crude oil, uh, for gold from Bitcoin, and what I will do is I, I will normalize the parameters, and then I will I will get any new stream of assets insured that I that I get. You say that every one of them is different, even if you normalize it. And in the case of trend following, they are all the same if you normalize them. Well, see, this is where I differ because I think that uh, mean reversion itself requires the knowledge of where the mean is and a knowledge of the standard deviation away from that mean for them to be able to correctly apply a trading system to extract arbitrage from that mean reverting property of that system. So you need a mean, you need a standard deviation. In our world of trend following, where we're attacking outliers, there is no concept called a single mean. There is no concept of a standard deviation. We apply golden rule. So we're applying cutting losses short letting profits run this golden rule is being applied which isn't a, a statistical rule it's it's a principle that's being applied to catch these outliers so we're applying a universal rule um, to target our outliers where i'd say that under mean reversion you've got to be much more prescriptive in how you extract that edge you've got to have an understanding of of these you know the characteristics of that price series how it mean reverts to be able to capture that property that that's how i view it but you know others might disagree cool thank you do you uh, think that uh, guys like for it's a totally different uh, style but guys like warren buffett for example do you think they also are after those outliers in in that sense i mean they are kind of following the same principle not saying Okay, I don't know which company will be, but when I get one comp one big company, one big stream, I'll bet big. And uh, so, in that sense, they are also kind of. I know that they they don't do as much as many uh, contracts or markets as a trend follower does, but they are also after that a huge outlier. And so, in that sense, they are uh, operating under principles instead of uh, statistic. Uh, statistic descriptions of what they are doing yeah look uh, with, with with warren buffett i'd say he is a value investor and um the 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 nature of a, a you know a value investing is that they have this appreciation of this this value called intrinsic price where they they calculate price should be they then assess where price currently is is it above that intrinsic value or is it below that intrinsic value so it is a convergent 
methodology in that it's assuming that price is going to revert to that intrinsic value. So the principle itself is convergent. But I think when you look at Warren Buffett's story and identify which were the stocks that, you know, the stocks that, um, you know, made Warren Buffett so successful as he is can be listed on the hand, you know, Coca-Cola, those sort of things. So really, uh, whilst he might profess that it's um, his technique, fundamental value investing, which is the way he is uh, obtaining his edge, I would argue that um, is actually through the fact that he has captured outliers in that series that has been responsible for his success. Now, is there a correlation between fundamental value and outliers? There, there probably is. I'd say there probably definitely is. But, um, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I don't know his strategy well enough. Um, Thank you. I, under, I want to say that for me personally, I have some uh, strategies that I don't accept. So I think uh, I don't accept... I'm against, for me personally, such things like global macro, like all kind of predictions of the events, and uh, maybe low targeting. So, and uh, if we are talking about mineral erosion systems, or one maybe... more question, Richard. Do you think that keep going, Oleg? Um, Cordura keeps cutting you off. I don't think he has this hardware problem. Oh, okay. That's okay. Maybe some program issues on your side. That's okay. Uh, and um, by the way, good questions you asked, Richard. Had. So I want uh, I want to say that um, I uh, some strategies I think can be profitable. I am not an expert, maybe in the mineral version. I am not an expert, maybe in some things. But I feel uh, that it can be profitable profitable for many years. But uh, I am against. As I have said a few minutes ago, I'm against all sorts of of wall targeting, all sorts of prediction uh, and uh, some other stuff. But uh, if we are talking about mean reversion, of course, we see here also, as I always say, when we trendfall, we apply to universal laws. And in mean reversion, maybe also we apply to universal laws, but I think the, there is it can be uh, some hidden some hidden problems maybe be with uh, in crisis environments or something like that and so trend following i think is more robust is more robust and so more safety it's my opinion only maybe i'm it's my opinion maybe i'm wrong but i think that mini version can be <laughs> some unpleasant surprises in crisis environments with big gaps or something like that. Uh, and I think mini version system must be more short term. I think so. So here's my point. And uh, I liked in Richard's uh, ideas, I liked very much. So I wanted to uh, move on and uh, <clears throat> get uh, Alp and Richard and Absolute to explain uh, their uh, conversation on Twitter about compounding, heavy lifting. Um, and I wasn't following that. I know that Alp and I don't ever disagree on anything, but when I was reading some of Alp's tweets, I was thinking, I think I might disagree with that. But then Richard started agreeing with Alp, so I was like, oh no, okay. There's no way in hell I'm disagreeing with Alp and Richard on the same subject. That's just not even possible. Okay, but uh, yeah, if, you, if uh, someone could summarize uh, where this was going, especially between Richard and uh, Absolute. But then I know Alp was in on it as well. So it was, it sounded like you guys were having some good debate. So, okay. Hi, guys. Um, so, so I'm using Donchin channel uh, with our Libars. And it is interesting that I'm ending up with these 5% outliers uh, on my back tests. And um, I was just thinking what those outliers are, you know, hunting those outliers, looking for those outliers. But what, what actually, you know, uh, what those outliers are? And I think those outliers are, are for me, they, are, they represent this super performance in some, in some shape or form. They are the super performance markets that we would want to attach ourselves to, Okay. And, uh, you know, when long-term traders talk about 50 to 100, uh, 
ATRs, uh, usually. It means for me it is 50 to 100 uh, hourly ATRs, not daily ATRs, but hourly ATRs. And um, so, you know, you would definitely want to capture uh, those outliers. And the question is, uh, you know, how are you going to construct that backtest? And I think yesterday we were talking about how to, you know, how to start constructing a backtest. Is uh, and there are various differences with the smaller accounts uh, to start your backtesting process. And uh, you know, Richard was talking about to capture the reality. Uh, you know, um, the, the the limits of the assets under management, the capital while trading, and how to capture that in a backtest. And you know, the starting point was, you know, just to start backtesting the uh, backtesting process without actually compounding it. So if you, uh, the compounding comes from uh, the using fixed fractional bet size. So it means the more you win and becomes profitable, uh, you know, these uh, 30 basis points is going to mean more position size as your capital grows. But to be able to look into the raw system and to understand your system on a raw level, you know, it might be better just to take a step back and leave the compounding aside and backtest the system and see whether you're able to capture those super performance markets, uh, super performance trades, which we call outliers, which are going to give you these 50 to 100 ATRs. Um, and to be able to get there, your starting point is, okay, let's use something else, very bare bones. And uh, let's start from a non-compounding point of view. And then Richard was actually doing something else that I wasn't doing because I'm not actually, uh, uh, you know, so he has embedded an additional process into it. And uh, the even, even with the, on compounding, you're going to end up with the profits. So that was uh, that that was the point. So so what what are you going to do with those profits? And uh, he he has a, a slightly more sophisticated way of dealing with it in the sense that he was increasing the diversification as he makes more money to be able to uh, come back to reality. Because as you make more money, you you actually have the ability to trade more markets. And that was the um, that that was a very useful conversation around how to construct a backtest. Actually, you know, rather than just uh, using a compounding at the inception, let let's go to the bare basics and then start from there and see whether we can capture these super performance markets or outliers and how to deal with them. Uh, thanks. Yes, that, 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 that's right, Alp. So the way I do my back test is I, I don't worry about any form of compounding until the very last method of treatment in my process, if it is necessary. And I'm trying to avoid compounding because there is a two-edged sword to compounding and leverage, as we know. And I want to avoid excessive volatility associated with leverage. So the way I do that is I say... Let's undertake a back test to develop an optimal asymmetry with an uncompounded solution. So what that therefore does is it says, right, let's apply a fixed dollar risk to each trade in my back test. Don't apply a percent trade risk to it. And therefore, um, you won't correlate with the level of equity when you're using a fixed dollar risk. In other words, a fixed dollar risk stays the same for each bet you place in your entire back test across your diversified portfolio. And then look at the result. And the idea being that you want to get the most asymmetric result you possibly can pre-compounding um, 
And then you know you've got the necessary asymmetry that's embedded or underlying in that equity curve before you then entertain the prospects of adding any leverage to it. So then the conversation got into, well, you know, um, what is the problem of leverage on um, being applied to this? And this, this, is, this is how I, I do it. I do a very, what, what, what I, I regard as a very realistic back test in that uh, when I'm doing my back test, I'm not just doing a hypothetical back test based on infinite levels of capital. I'm basically doing a back test that says, this is my finite level of capital at the beginning of the exercise on an uncompounded basis. So let's say I start off with $200,000 and that therefore limits the my ability to have um, maximum diversification. And what I'm doing there is I'm saying, what is the smallest bet size that I can get across my universe in that portfolio with $200,000? where I don't bump into my broker limitations of minimum lot size. I need freedom of movement and I don't need, to, I don't want to bump into that minimum lot size because what that means is that I can get excessive risk on an individual trade if it forces me up to a, a higher lot than is within my risk settings of say um, a maximum loss of say $500 per trade on a $200,000 account. Also, what I'm doing there is the, the finite capital at that point in time severely restricts the ability for me to diversify as wide as I want to go. So with that unco uncompounded solution, then over the course of time, I generate profits uncompounded in that process. Then the question is, well, now you've generated profits from that uncompounded compounded process. How do you use those profits? Now, most people might say, well, you reinvest those profits into higher lot sizes for the existing portfolio you're trading. And I'm saying, no, I think a better way to do this is to use those profits to actually increase your diversification and reduce your bet size. The idea being that I'm wanting, my entire objective is to get maximal diversification within my finite capital constraints. And therefore, the way I'm doing it with an un uncompounded solution is, I'm trying to get maximum diversification as my capital grows uncompounded because then I know once that's all achieved, I can then look at my equity curve and lo and behold, I find that my equity curve actually has a, um, a non-linear profile. It actually has an asymmetric uplift. Now, this is unlike most other back tests where you get a linear equity curve under maximal diversification. This is because as my capital is growing and I'm getting wider and wider diversification, my KGAR is actually getting better. And this is because the principles that Jerry and I talk about is under maximal diversification, you hunt wide if you're outliers, you get a greater distribution of outliers in your distribution. And with maximal system diversification, you can spread those outliers throughout the, the time series. The impact of that is that it actually gives you this optimal asymmetry in your equity curve uncompounded. Then you say to yourself, well, do I need to compound this solution? Because if, if I've got this um, uncompounded um, equity curve that's got this optimal asymmetry, I therefore only need to very weakly compound this solution rather than a heavy compounded solution where I turn everything into a trade risk percentage and then it just ramps up and gives me excessive volatility. I'm looking for this optimal, what do, what do I call it, reward to risk relationship, uncompounded. And then that gives me a lot of degrees of, of freedom to say, I don't need to compound this as excessively as other funds do, like Paul Mulvaney's fund, which gets this massive sort of volatility associated with the level of leverage he has. I think I can achieve a better story with optimal asymmetry without that necessary pogo stick of volatility associated with leverage. That's what I'm trying to do um, in this process. Does that make sense? Ooh. Hi, guys. Um, hi, everybody. It's been two weeks. We haven't met. Um, yeah, I think this uh, the Twitter thread started with uh, after I listened to after I listened to Richard's um, uh, podcast with Nils, where uh, he said that um, he is achieving um, exponential equity curves without compounding, and uh, my comment was that 
I have never seen such a thing. So I have never seen. So he doesn't. Basically, he doesn't like a straight line. Most uncompounded equity curves I've seen, the good ones, are usually linear, straight lines, hopefully going upwards with a certain tilt, which is the average return. And uh, and uh, then there's volatility. Then there's the fluctuation around that, that straight line that goes up. So when Richard says that he is achieving exponential growth without compounding, I've, I found that interesting because I have never seen that. And But uh, we clarified it. It's just a matter of definitions in, in the tweets. So I think I'm... I'm my statement remains correct that you cannot achieve exponential growth or because exponential growth means uh, increasing CAGR. And Richard says that his CAGR increases as he increases diversification. But I claim that the increased CAGR is not from increased diversification. It's actually from compounding. But where, the, the prof where he actually uses the profits from realized trades instead of to increase the current bet size in the current ensemble, to expand the ensemble. But expanded ensemble means more bets being made. So actually, you're not making the same number of bets with increased size, but you're keeping the size per bet fixed, just increasing the number of bets, which, for which you need more capital. Because if you had the bigger capital, which is the initial capital plus profits, you would have traded that diversified, bigger, wider ensemble anyway. So the increase in capital that your profits are providing are allowing you to increase your betting. But increased betting, not in the sense of increased the same number of bets with increased size per bet, just keeping the size per bet fixed, but just increasing the number of bets you're making. To me, that's just utilizing new capital. You're utilizing more capital because you could not trade those number of bets with that size with the smaller capital. Or if you tried to trade them, your risk would be higher or much, much higher than you were prepared to accept. So to me, um, I see it's just a matter of definition. Richard considers increasing the ensemble, spreading the profits, spreading the new capital or increased capital across a wider ensemble, he does not consider that compounding because he keeps a fixed dollar risk per trade. So he says, oh no, that's not compounding because my risk per trade is fixed, I'm not compounding. Whereas I say in my definition of compounding, no, you are compounding because now you're using more risk, which the bigger capital allows you, to keep the risk per capital relatively fixed. So the CAGR is increasing. Uh, actually, now, if, if you... CAGR would not be increasing if you account for increased account size, which is compounding. So let's say account, 200,000. Richard says he starts with 200 grand. Now account grows to 300 grand. Now he, instead of increasing all bet sizes by 50%, he increases the ensemble by 50%. So instead of trading uh, 1,000 system markets, combination, pairs of systems and markets, he will be now trading 1,500 um, system markets, but with fixed bet, bet size. So... But so now CAGR, if we calculate CAGR on a capital of 300 grand, CAGR on the percentage basis will be the same. That CAGR will only be increased as you, if you look at it as a percentage from the initial capital, the non-compounded 200 grand. So, uh, so to me, if, if this is what's actually happening and what Richard is doing, this proves that he is compounding. And CAGR is not increasing, which means the, the non-compounded curve is not exponentially increasing, and it's the compounded curve that's exponentially increasing. Throw a spanner in the work here. Uh, absolute. It is increasing, and I'll tell you why. It's not increasing because of compounding. It's increasing because the diversification process is actually getting more outliers in your distribution. So... I've tested this and I've done a lot of research on this. And, and the example is it's because of selection bias. When you have four systems, let's say you've got a, a possible universe of 30 markets 
And let's say um, with minimal diversification, you only have access to four of those possible 30 markets. And let's say there is only one outlier existing in that ensemble of four systems. When What I'm saying is that with diversification with trend-following models where you're attacking these non-linear features called outliers, by increasing the um, amount of diversification, you're reducing selection bias. So um, you are getting the maximum number of possible outliers in the total population as you progressively um, go towards maximum diversification. You are not falling under the, um, the problem of missing outliers because of you know, small sample selection. So what that does, the maximum diversification is migrating CAGR to a higher level, not through compounding, because I'm getting this in uncompounded models. When I plot the distribution of my portfolios based on a portfolio of four, a portfolio of 20, a portfolio of 30 markets, a portfolio of 40 markets, because I'm targeting these nonlinear anomalies, I'm finding that CAGR does increase and my drawdown stays about the same level. This is different to uh, a convergent model, which is targeting linear features, uh, where you find that the CAGR actually migrates to the middle of the distribution. Because we're targeting outliers, it actually forces the result of the portfolio to the right towards higher CAGR. So that's why I think that um, maximum diversification is the reason I'm doing this with uncompounded models, because when we hunt wider for outliers, we are reducing the selection by missing them. It's like like sort of type two errors when you trade with a small portfolio, as opposed to a maximally diversified portfolio where you're getting as many outliers as you can in your distribution. Okay. Um, I, mean, I think we, we agree and we have agreed that um, that uh, maximum diversification is desirable, and and you should be as diversified as possible, given what what your capital is and what your liquidity requirements are. Um, so, when you say that your KGAR is increasing without compounding, uh, that's that's not increasing without compounding KGAR. Not CAGR. Your return to risk ratio will improve with diversification. Your return to risk ratios, so return to drawdown and return to volatility, of course, will increase with more with 30 markets versus four markets. Now you may say, "Oh, but this is because I'm counting outliers. If I cover 30 markets, I'll catch more outliers." But it doesn't matter. I'm not counting outliers, and I'm not convergent trading. And my K my CAGR per drawdown per unit of drawdown or per unit of volatility increases with every added market that I do. And so that's I'm why I say you get a, you get a smooth um, portfolio of equity curve. No, no yes, question. Yeah, you're but not, you're but not hunting I'm not outliers. Claiming, but, oh, but I'm not claiming that I'm in, my, my CAGR increases without compounding. It has nothing but to I do am whether you compound I'm or not. hunting outliers. No, I'm hunting outliers, and that is why my CAGR is increasing. You're not no. hunting outliers, and your CAGR <laughs> isn't increasing. You're getting a linear it's, equity curve. It's increasing. It's my CAGR per drawdown is increasing. Yeah. I can ramp the leverage. But you're not getting this asymmetric um, exponential uplift in your equity curve, are you? Richard, okay, let me ask you a question. Would you CAGR increase if you're running $100 million without compounding? Will your equity curve be exponential if you're running yeah, $100 yes, million without yes. compounding? Yes. Tell me how. Yes. Tell me how. Because I'd be able to maximally diversify with that hundred okay, thousand dollars far be, more than with say two hundred thousand. No, but, be, but with that with that hundred thousand dollars, I'd be spread across far more markets and have far more ensembles no, no, of systems 100 working. Million, 100 yeah, hundred million. million. Okay, hundred million as opposed to two hundred thousand. I'd be maximally yep. diversified or much more yep. diversified. Yes, and because of that. I would have a greater representation of outliers in my distribution, which will give me this exponential uplift uncompounded. What? Uh, okay, so you're telling me if I gave you $100 million now, you will be able to produce an exponential equity curve by keeping your trading size at $100 million? 
without compounding. You're going to keep trade, your trade keep size 100 million. Your ensemble is sec. fixed. Are you we talking about trade size 100? We're talking about trade size 100 million. We're talking about a portfolio of 100 million. I don't understand the difference. In Jerry's language, trading size is the sizes at which his portfolio is when he increases or decreases it. No, hey, okay, portfolio, portfolio. You have 100 million yeah. and you're yep. maximally diversified. You cannot add any more markets. That's it. You have all it, the systems and all the markets that you can possibly trade. Yes, and, and you know how I can prove that? Because I can sit a $100 million theoretical portfolio next to my $200,000 portfolio and I'll find that Kager exponentially uplifts between the two. And that is because I'm getting maximal diversification with far more capital. Okay, what do you mean uplift? You're already uplift. at your okay. maximum. How can you okay. uplift from the maximum? What is the maximum? Because what is I'm saying without lies, okay, the losses are linear. The profits are non-linear. Many orders of magnitude greater than the losses. Maybe 2.5 to 3 times the order of the losses. If you diversify and you get a greater distribution of non-linear performance in your equity curve, you will produce an exponentially rising equity curve. It's okay, we're not I, going I apples for apples. Okay, I don't know. I'm I don't maybe we don't understand each other. I don't know what language we speak, but I claim that you cannot have an exponential equity curve with starting with hundred million dollars without compounding. I, yep, we we gathered that. That yep, I understand what you're saying, but I'm saying you do. So you know, um, one of the. Um, Richard brought up a good point, and I think that, and I agree totally uh, with that process of research your system, and I love the trade stats, and I not only do I not, when I'm evaluating which systems to choose, underline that, so there's different processes here, one is I want to figure out which systems I should use, and which parameters, so when I do that, I not only am not going to pay attention to compounding, later, 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 I'll get to that later. It's a process here. There's different steps. So first thing is, I love looking at these trade stats. Average trade, average win, average loss, win percentage. So I'm extracting from, and you know me, I'm going to ignore, when I even get to the equity stats, I'm going to ignore any, all the equity in between the entries and the exits, all the volatility. Um, I'm ignoring that. I don't care about that. I'm a turn off. As soon as Absolute mentions, blah, 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 per unit of drawdown. I mean, my brain is just turned off. Okay, so uh, when I pull out of there and I see these amazing trade stats, um, average trade of four ATRs or 3.5, you know, average trade. And so these are pretty compelling. My edge is pretty high. And so then uh, I'm going to be very conservative when I uh, start applying leverage and unit sizes and I, we always hear all of this talk about um, you're blowing it by not paying more attention to compounding. And, um, but we're keeping this trade level kind of constant, and it's based upon something, a number way less than total AUM, uh, because I'm really afraid that I'm going to add on a bunch of positions randomly. You know, the market, the signals are being hit. I can't control when the breakouts occur, and I'm getting in and out of trades. And I'm just afraid that I'm going to throw on a lot of trades at equity highs. So I'm getting this great compounding uh, in 2022. But what's 2023 going to look like when I start putting on trades? Possibly. I've seen this happen before. To, not to me, because I don't do it this way, but to others. <clears throat> and um, as you're making money in 2022 and you're totally over um, allocated to interest rates and you're making all of this money and you're increasing your positions. They increase their positions monthly. They true them up based upon, uh, there's no signal that's been hit for a year and they're uh, truing up their position. So that can't be right. And uh, so I am going to be very concerned about the negative aspect of this compounding and um, putting on trades, you know, it's going to bother me to no end to put on these trades that are due to uh, money management compounding, trying to capture that, that has nothing to do with the original signal. I put my trades on at the original signal a year or two ago, and I don't really touch them unless I have an additional redemption, of course. So I just think uh, proper money management, <clears throat> the way I was taught, was to increase your trade level slow, slow. 
very slow. Uh, you can trade larger, the unit sizes will be a bit larger to offset some of that. But I'm trading my, I'm increasing, I'm capturing profit in a slow way because a lot of this profit is open trade equity. It's going to violently fluctuate. <clears throat> they, uh, other people take care of that by continually adjusting that trade level uh, for open profits and for volatility. So, but then on the downside, when you're losing money, the trade level is adjusted much faster. So I think um, one of the issues that Richard and I have <clears throat> that we speak about sometimes is we're totally um, afraid of what's not in that back test. Okay, so I do have a question um, to Jerry Parker. Uh, Jerry, you just mentioned at the beginning of the conversation um, the one of the key reasons of choosing one entry, uh, one exit, one stop model was the fact that the sample size. So if you have, uh, because you're a long-term trader, uh, obviously uh, the sample size is always going to be a, a consideration and, and things are a little bit more relaxed while trading intraday, uh, intra in hourly bars. Uh, there are more trades. So, and that's the question. So if you would, it, um, so instead of just having one entry, one exit, one stop, you know, um, let's say you have uh, a 20 basis risk per market and, you know, you, you could actually, uh, you know, have multiple entries on the same uh, on the same trend. So you would have done, uh, you know, five basis points uh, times four instead of just risking 20 basis points on one go, which means there, there's going to be a much more concentration with the current model, uh, and if you divide it into four uh, four entries, it's going to be less co concentration and more diversification. And what? So, am I understand you right? So, the main reason why you ended up with one entry, one exit, one stop is mainly the sample size. And if you would have more sample size, you could have chosen to have multiple entries. Thank you. Oh, well, <clears throat> well, sample size, yes. That is, uh, as I've sort of jokingly said, whenever someone asks you a question about trading, the answer is start off with sample size. That's, that's the difference between managed futures, CTAs, and turtle CTAs. Um, so, and it's important to separate um, each in the four systems. So the four systems each have one entry, one exit, and a stop loss. And they have their own individual sample size. And they are treated and they act like no other system exists. They're not correlated, connected. I split the equity up in four ways. 25% of the equity goes to each of the four systems. So that is not the same as polluting one of those systems with four entries and four exits. That you can't do because uh, that... You have to match up the entry and exits to count your sample size. <clears throat> so if you have an entry that is, um, I have an entry plus a filter. So both things have to happen on the same day uh, for, for me to go long. I have to have the breakout and then I have to have the filter satisfied, which is not hard for it to be satisfied. Uh, and, it, and it's not ever going to miss a big trend. So because it's an and, A and B, uh, whenever I do a trade, I can count that entry and pair it up with the stop loss exit or pair it up with the, tr the trailing stop exit. But if I had an or entry where it's A or B, that has split my sample size. It's reduced it because the A entry has to be paired up with its exits, the B entry has to be paired up with its exits. And of course, this is exactly what people do on exits. They, they have exits where if the breakout gets hit, then get out. However, if something else was to occur, the market goes down too much, get out on that as well. And so people input these things into their system that reduces their sample size. And they have a tendency not to agree with me, which is to you must pair up every entry and exit and put that in its separate bucket. Most 
people, from what I gather and when I listen to them, they just total up the trades. And I have a sample size. I've totaled up all the trades. I've mixed them all together. And I don't think that's correct. But managed future CTAs in the uh, Top Traders Unplugged uh, series, which I thoroughly enjoyed. Uh, I mean, you know, I enjoy things that I agree with. That was rare. I enjoy things probably more so that I disagree with. <laughs> it makes me think I'm so damn smart and um, because they're all doing it wrong. But I'm joking. But um, I've realized that managed futures CTAs, all these years that I have been harassing these large CTAs, making millions, hundreds of millions of dollars for themselves uh, every year, and I've been harassing them as they've been kicking my ass, um, talking about sample size. They have been laughing, probably. They should be, because they have no... They have no desire to look at things in terms of sample size. There's no discrete trades, entry, exit, and count those up in any way, the right way or the wrong way. It's this portfolio that's balanced and massaged every day based upon volatility, correlation, and um, constant vol management and correlation management. And then um, I guess there must be a trend signal in there to know that, okay, we have to flip the yen, we have to flip the euro, uh, and then let's go back to this, looking at this bowl of soup that needs to a little bit of salt and a little bit of pepper. You know, historically, these uh, trend-following firms have high correlation among themselves, you know, uh, Chesapeake versus, let's say, Don uh, versus, you know, um, you know, other other well-known uh, trend following CTAs and the thing about uh, the the techniques that are used could actually well be very different uh, to capture those trends but you it, you know however your entry method is you end up with on the on the same so however different surfboards surfboard you use you're still surfing on the same wave i mean um so you know that for instance i'm a short-term trader but i'm uh so i, I could end you know my short systems uh, i do have a longer system or, or short-term systems in while trading hourly bars and i could possibly trade as high as 50 trades uh, per market uh, for a single return stream or as low as 10 uh, if I go a little bit longer term but you're still utilizing the same trend so if there is going to be a trend on the euro dollars so you're going to be riding that trend and everyone else is riding the same trend so what happens is there could be different entry methods to utilize to get on the euro dollar trend so some people buy but may use more uh, statistical methods. Uh, some people, uh, you know, like myself uh, and others could use channel breakouts and some some others might use, you know, uh, re recently I was just looking into the Bill Eckhart's uh, website, which is a very good website. If you haven't seen it, uh, just check out his website. And he was using... Um, a, a short-term trend system based on a sentiment data. And I thought, you know, probably we are on the same trends because my short-term systems are also, you know, highly correlated with the market sentiment. And so I quite quickly uh, turned my position uh, from one side to the other when market sentiment changes. But he's doing it without, he specifically mentioned that it is a non-price system. So he's probably doing it using more of a, you know, fundamentals and other uh, non-price data. But you end up, you end up on the same trend. If it is a short-term trend, you're gonna jump over it. But your, the way you capture it is going to be different. So that's why, however you do, you you cannot escape the fact that these uh, these firms are going to end up with high correlation, but. Yeah, and, and for the people uh, uninitiated outside, while looking into it, they think that they will be doing completely different stuff. Um, but the only question is whether you're doing it right. And 
I agree with what Jerry Parker is saying in the sense that if you do not have a lot of sample size, then things get statistically murky. But of course, while trading short term, because we do not have such restrictions around the sample size. So this, you know, uh, and all the things that Jerry Parker is complaining is about all the sample size. But then the question is, if you have enough sample size, then would you do all the other stuff? Oh, I want to say that, uh, first of all, uh, the main problems of short-term systems are uh, noise, a lot of noise uh, on some periods. And uh, the second issue is cost. And I think that, uh, I have said this before, that if we trade in a short-term space, I think we need some filtering here. But of course, not such type of filters in which you, you can miss the trade, of course. And so, of course, maybe we are on the one side of the trade. But for me personally, I think it's better to trade maybe, it's my little <laughs> secret from my research, uh, maybe not very precise, uh, to trade in the direction of a big, for example, to, to take signal in a direction of maybe 200 days breakout, short-term signal, okay, but only in one direction. And so you will reduce your, you will reduce this uh, noise, partly. I think it can help. Uh, but, uh, of course, it's not the universal decision, maybe, but I think it can help. And also, I want to say that about sample size in short-term systems. In a short-term space, there was a different. For example, uh, I, I think it's very important to understand in what regime we are trading. And so, if we are trading, uh, we, we, for example, we ha can have 500 uh, samples from short-term space, for example, for a few months, and 500 uh, trades in a long term for maybe 10 years, 5 years. So, and we can see different regimes. And so it's also very important in what regime we operate. So, also we must understand this. Help you, you make a good point there, but I, I challenge that because um, when I undertake these um, reviews of these um, performance metrics for the, um, the trend following programs, I find that there, uh, when we look at, say, a 20 year history, we don't find that the um, we find a considerable dispersion in the correlations amongst the managers. So, you know, if for instance I'm using SG Trend, for instance, as my correlation measure, and then I'm um, sorting all of the 55 programs that are classified in, you know, that, which have a 20 year track record, and I'm sorting them, I'm finding that they're dispersing from a correlation of about 0.92 down to about 0.61 in correlation to SG Trend. And when I look at how they are sorted, I find that, you know, things like MAN AHL, um, Dunn Capital, uh, Lynx, uh, that they have a very high level of correlation. But then when I see where Paul Mulvaney sits, I see that Jerry sits right next to him. I see that Aspects sits right next to him in correlation. So over a very long term, I, I do think we get a clustering or a dispersion into groupings of trend-following managers by virtue of the processes that they deploy. And that's where I say that um, classic trend-following actually does produce a different result to um, these alternate managers that are, you know, might, might be multi-strat or might be incorporating different um, definitions of trend into their, um, their metrics because I'm seeing that in the dispersion in the correlations. I mean, they have to. Or they're not trading, they're being dishonest on how they trade. And I'm talking about tr uh, trend outlier hunting CTAs. <clears throat> because look, the, the other managed futures CTAs you mentioned, they're replicable. They're being replicated. It's easy to replicate. It's a group of traders that makes it easier. They're vol managing, correlation managing. They're getting rid of these outliers as best they can if they show increased volatility and increased correlation, which a lot of the outliers will do, if not all of them. And so <clears throat> they're easily, as Neil said many times, he, um, I don't see a lot of difference. There is no difference with these managed futures CTAs unless they add in non-trend or um, 
you know, in which they do. They add in these non-trend, short-term, mean reversion, carry trade, all of this other stuff that they add into the trend to smooth it out. <clears throat> as uh, the guys were saying, um, a trend is the bad medicine. This is just wonderful stuff. You know, people put this out there. It's going to last a long time. It's so silly. It's just so much fun that there's other people other than me saying embarrassing things on podcast <clears throat> and spaces. And um, I, I just love this. So when the, if the trend followers are coming along, the outlier hunter trend followers and not, not uh, adjusting the orange juice trade, the Tesla trade, and due to correlation and volatility, letting it run and making 100 to 500 ATRs with tremendous volatility, uh, <clears throat> then they're not being, then if you don't see different performance, they're not doing that. They're vol managing or getting out of the trades quicker as well. So uh, the reason that Niels doesn't see much of a difference is he doesn't, there is not many people who do that. It's me, Richard, and Mulvaney, and whoever else is on this call. Who is, but look, we're not in the Sokjin indexes, right? In any indexes. So uh, what we do is dumb and simple and unsophisticated, as some of these people on Niels's podcast were saying, um, because hunting outliers and not paying attention to vol is uh, what the turtles did in the 90s, and it's laughable. And so, uh, but we continue to do it, and it's not laughable. It is more profitable, safer, better risk adjusted. They just uh, need to measure risk in a different way with vol and sharp, and we don't. We, um, we have verified, it's important. Like one of the things that Richard Dennis said when he first started was he would have fun looking at cliches and proving them wrong. Um, but this cliche of letting profits run and taking small losses, we have proved through our back test <clears throat> and through looking at risk in a different way, um, not with vol or sharp, that not only do these systems make the most amount of money and letting them run and being faithful to a robust system is the best way to maximize your profit. But by the very definition of that cliche, uh, it speaks to the fundamental principle of trend following, which is to separate your behavior with winners and losers. And we go and we say, of course. Thus, we also must consider <clears throat> separating the accumulation of those winners and, and losers, open trade equity, closed trade equity, and, tr and utilizing that information that's not readily available from a performance table to see a better ways of defining risk in a real world fashion. And this is exactly what we do. Uh, it looks, by the way, very beautiful how I fully agree with Jerry. And for me personally, I did my research in 2016, 2017, and I saw how beautiful for me personally it is not adjust anything. When I started my trade, uh, and see how this wall increase and all that and not adjust and have all this profit. And um, for me personally, uh, I love this methodology. I love this ide ide ideology not to adjust. No wall targeting. I did a wall targeting program in 2016, but I stopped it. I didn't like this. So I fully agree with Jerry. It's really wonderful. Total, total is wonderful. And, you know, um, in terms of these correlations, um, I've just had a quick look into, you know, the classic uh, managers like, you know, uh, Chesapeake, Eckhart, Abraham Trading, um, Rubber, Market Research. And these are, you know, incredibly correlated, you know, when I look into those numbers. And also, even the you know others. So if I if I compare these classic managers with others, um, 
um, still there, there is an element of uh, correlation. Uh, you know, correlation is not as high as 0.7 or 0.8, perhaps, but you know, it can. Uh, you know, it is still uh, not less than uh, 0.3. You know, 0.3 or 0.4. When you know, uh, when I look into, let's say, Chesapeake versus uh, Saxon Investments, I'm not quite sure whether Saxon Investments are around at the moment. But you know, um, so even though the um, the main uh, volatility manager manager guys are still uh, using. These uh, these techniques to avoid uh, chasing these super performance markets, what we call outliers, and they are still you know uh, doing dynamic position sizing, because there is an element of trend there. That correlation, I don't think that is going to go less than 0.3 uh, when when we compare. Uh, you know, uh, let's say Dunn versus uh, Jerry Parker. But if we just compare the classic guys as a group, yes, then the correlations are going to be just obviously high, like 0.7 or 0.8, uh, I presume. You know, that's that was the uh, understanding that I had based on uh, the analysis that, that, that I've done for some time. But, you know, anyone else, please feel free to correct me if I'm not to the point. Thanks. Yes, Al, that's what I found as well. So I was trying to identify in that listing of the ones I follow, who were the classic trend followers. Now, unfortunately, I don't know what's under the hood of all of these programs. Um, so the way I did it was I said, who has the closest correlation? So um, what I found, um, I, I had a cutoff where anything above 0.82 or anything above 0.8 correlation uh, to um, Chesapeake or to Mulvaney. I knew Jerry's was classic, um, so I used his as a benchmark. And then I said, who plots closest to Jerry? And I came up with Paul Mulvaney, Jerry. Um, I think it was Aspect. I think it was um, uh, another one of the ex-Turtle guys who runs a program. Jerry, you might be able to help me here. Um, oh. Rubber? Oh, um uh, don't worry, don't worry. But anyway, but I, I was finding what you found. But, but it was around about 0.82. They were all very highly correlated. And even though um, <clears throat> I think it's totally fine, and I, it's not even an, an issue in my mind that um, you, I don't really think <clears throat> I have an opinion one way or the other for other people as to how many markets they trade. <clears throat> I... You know, tr I tr always try to understand and learn and adopt a basic philosophy of how things work, and then I push it to the max. So it's totally normal for my personality to trade 300 markets. Now, you know, are you satisfied? Am I going to stop? I, I can't be trusted. You know, if I got more AUM and I might be at 500, I can't be trusted to be normal and to moderate my behavior in the pursuit of, of trading. I'm going to push it, and, and I'm going to challenge myself to do more and more. But if some people want to trade 50 or 60 markets, that's fine. You know, that's, it's everybody can have their own choice. The choices are performance and lifestyle and AUM and staffing. So um, not philosophy, because you should try to trade as many as possible, but you don't, you don't have to. So given that, even if we had a group of outlier hunting classic trend followers and we were comparing them, um, we're going to trade different markets, especially if we start trading stocks. And we're in one year, I'm going to get an outlier in a stock and in stocks that other people are not going to get and vice versa. So even within... We can't trust that the outlier hunters are going to always look that correlated strictly for that reason. The reason we can't be replicated is because Andrew would have to trade 300 markets because I'm not going to cut back on OJ. And OJ may dominate my performance along with a um, 
a handful of other markets, and some of those markets might not be in the portfolios of other outlier hunting CTAs. They could absolutely be in the portfolio of Aspect, but Aspect is going to, and the managed futures people are going to scale it back because what has happened with that OJ Vol? It's probably five to ten times what it was when I put the trade on a long time ago. You know, it's interesting, Jerry, because I was closely listening to all of those episodes of the um, uh, that Niels has had recently with the different um, program managers. And what I found is that whenever we had um, a, a program manager um, that had high levels of diversification, like Harold, I think he's got about 500 um, in his diversification aspect. I think he's got about 300 or 400 yourself. Uh, when I compare it to yourself, I notice that they never mention about volatility targeting. But all of the other managers who had lesser levels of diversification, you know, up to 100, um, they all talked about volatility targeting. And I'm wondering whether this volatility targeting is a is a symptom associated with um, trying to address a portfolio that doesn't have this level of diversification that, that we're dealing with. Well, I think that... Um the my best guess was that they and i've said this before they're doing it wrong on the beginning and so they have to make up for this incorrect trading idea by vol managing so they're not using a conservative trade level that coincides with an elevated unit size that that um which is fine. And one of the reasons that I do this, one of the reasons is to, is to increase consistency. I want to trade the same size, unit size all the time, of course, unless I start adding more markets. And then I, want to, I don't want to change my trade level very often. Um, and I want my trade level to be um, close to the closed trade equity. Okay. So since they're not doing that and they are using current equity, and with all of the issues with using current equity, it's great when things are great, 2022. And then in 2023, all those new trades put on in January are at this high elevated all-time equity highs, AUM. And then they have to uh, start losing. They start putting on trades that are going to lose. It's inevitable. Uh, it's going to work, and then it's not going to work. Um, so they had better vol manage that crap because that's going to spin out of control. And so where you and I sit there and let our profits run and follow the system and we can experience these drawdowns, but in our philosophy and in the evidence of our back test is you cannot make more money uh, with money management and random entries and exits and discretion than the system will make by itself. Okay, so that's why we're very comfortable um, letting all hell break loose with these with volatility and retracements and stuff because we're totally wedded to the philosophy of following the system and paying attention to the back test that says you're going to make the most amount of money by being longer term and letting these profits run and don't be so eager to get out. So they must manage these things, this open trade equity, because it's a tiger. They got a tiger by the tail. Uh, it is going crazy and things can spin out of control from a risk point of view and you're darn right they're looking at AUM and Sharp and Vol and the drawdowns where we're, we, don't, we don't have that freaky behavior. We don't have to. We're not going to be put in those situations when all hell is breaking loose and scrambling to, to do those right trades. One of the things I thought was very interesting um, with the aspect one as well is um, the only manager I've ever heard – and Niels was a bit skeptical, but not much. Uh, when Niels was saying to him uh, in all of his uh, interviews and every, almost everything he had ever heard about trend following, that most of the trend followers, notwithstanding these guys have 10 billion under management, um, had found that they would have to evolve into a longer track, a longer term trend following. And, uh, that is something that I've done and I've heard. And of course, a lot of these big managers have done as well. Also with shorter term stuff, let's say, and um, other strategies, of course. But the trend following piece itself, 
I've never heard anyone say except um, in that interview that no, they've not seen that as any reason to um, to go longer term. And um, so all I can I heard that about, as well, Jerry. I, yeah. I heard that as well. And and you know what what struck my my mind. Um, when I when I heard that, I immediately looked at what is the length of hold that Aspect have, and they've always been apparently medium term. And I remember back to your conversation where you said back in the turtle days you were trading short term, and your decision when in hindsight when you looked at that decision you realised that medium to long term was always the best. And that made me think, well, maybe they struck on medium term and they haven't had the change because it has always been the best. Right. So I was trying to figure out a way that his statement could be true. And yet um, the evidence that all of the rest of the CTAs, this is universal. It doesn't really, it's really not uh, anything that um, everybody, whether you vol manage or not, correlation manage or port, just have this uh, portfolio type of strategy uh, is going to see the same issues with trading shorter term. Uh, and then this one firm that stands uh, uh, different from all the rest. And the only thing I could come up with is that um, they don't, uh, it, I mean, I don't think it's uh, the way to say it, but I, but it's a situation where they're not, speaking to the question that we think that they're speaking to, which is, has your long-term trend following, has your trend following uh, holding period increased? I think that he might be speaking to, has the holding period of all of your trades increased? And so that's easily possible that they have not, depending upon the level of, it could be in a vast increase in vol management and correlation management and other types of trading that when you add up all the trades, they have, they are not shorter term. They're not longer term. And, but the trend following itself, of course, which was what we thought was being asked, um, was of course, it has to be sped up. It has to slow down. We have to have longer holding periods uh, because of the markets have changed a bit since the late nineties to punish shorter term trend and uh, of course they trade 10 billion <laughs> so it's somewhat laughable uh but i do think that that's the only thing i could figure out as to how he technically might have been uh telling the truth that um if you look at all of their trades what do you think it was it was certainly an interesting comment and you know um nils was taken aback, aback by it but um, yeah it was very interesting so what what, what are your thoughts on the running multiple strategies, guys, you know. Um, so, Jerry, it seems that there's a shift um, in the industry uh, with the advancement of technology. Now, with very simple tools, I think, uh, you know, I was just watching Nick Raj uh, after Richard's reply uh, this morning. So he's promoting a new uh, piece of uh, software to trade multiple strategies. And I think um, in this big manager conversations that the Niels was doing, uh, Kaplan Company is, uh, you know, one-stop shop uh, to multiple strategies. And, uh, you know, and, you know, I was speaking with some uh, another uh, manager at some point and he, he was favoring this maximum 5% drawdown. So, I mean, there, there, is a perce there is a perception that is being created at the moment that the more strategies that you trade, you can get closer to this maximum 5% drawdown and you can actually shoot for the moon. Um, and, you know, if if you are not very careful, you might actually believe into that. So I, I, I'm, I'm just curious about to hear uh, your comments on um, on this. Thanks. Alp, I, I agree with the principle of... Um... System diversification, but um, where I disagree with the principle is where you're blending different systems that don't give lifting power. In other words, you know, if, if we, a good example is a 60 40 portfolio. So in that instance, we blended, you know, 60% of equities with 40% of bonds. Now, the combination smoothed the result, 
but it didn't give any lifting power and a solution. All it did was smooth the outcome um, with no lifting power. So where I think um, system diversification in trend following models really comes to um, be possibly a really good um, success story, and I know that Bill Eckhart focuses on maximum system diversification. I've, I've read a few of his pieces where he really is heavily invested in system diversification of trend following models. Um, I tend to agree with that principle because I think you're not sacrificing lifting power, but you are getting significant um, levels of um, uncorrelated benefit through the use of ensembles of systems. And this is partly because by using different configured systems, you're not just looking at uncorrelated relationships, you're actually looking at um, um, a, a, a co a sort of um, a co-integrated um, relationship in the system design, which really does break down the level of correlations between these systems. So when, when you, for, for, for me, um, if, if I want to, um, yeah, if I had one trend following system I might find that I do find that after about um, diversifying across 60 markets, I might find that um, the benefits of that diversifi uh, diversification start um, r reaching marginal utility. But the way I find that if I apply an ensemble of, say, eight systems or 15 systems, I can diversify much wider across my markets because the system diversification is breaking down the level of correlation between the markets. So um, it, it's just a matter of trying to think of creative ideas so that is always reducing the level of correlation in your portfolio without sacrificing its ability to hunt for outliers. If you can achieve those two, outcomes you get lifting power and you get smoothness and i think that's that's the challenge for trend followers and where you know jerry in his striving for 300 markets then to 500 markets i think this is going to be a natural result that comes from that maximum diversification he is going to find that his equity curve as he uh, more aggressively diversifies becomes smoother without compromising the outliers that's the way i'm treating it but i've got to do it a bit differently because i don't have the levels of capital jerry has so i've got to focus on system diversification before i can really start getting heavy in my market diversification and I mean, that's very good uh, thanks richard and you know the question would be you know if Jerry, because Jerry is uh, talking about, you know, constant, constantly using four models. So, so what I'm hearing from you is if someone else with a, you know, large assets under management would actually increase the number of systems utilized, you, you said that you're using 15, let's say, with the enough capital, you probably could use 100 uh, systems. So instead of going like what Harold has done that you mentioned, like uh, Stansted, right? Like instead of going for 500 markets, if you go, if, you, if you're going to keep your markets like uh, down capital, let's say around 50 to 60 markets, but you're going to utilize 100 systems. So that second approach might actually provide uh, better uh, diversification benefits uh, because of the way that you are trying to access to those outliers. Am I am I getting it right? That that's how I feel. But you know, Jerry might argue with me saying that look, uh, it's better to have market diversification than it is to have system diversification. Yet, I found it difficult to agree with that. Um, I'm finding that I'm getting a lot of benefits from my system diversification. Um, in, in its ability to deliver uncorrelated relationships. So it, it's, a, it's a hard one to answer, but that, that's, I agree with you, Alp. That's, that's how I'm thinking. Well, I'm just glad I don't have to make that choice. I'm sure you could figure it out on, on the research and backtesting, which one's more important. But I think um, trading as many markets as possible, and which I can do. You know, I can trade 300. I could trade more than four. Uh, we used to trade two, and that's how we got trained. You know, two is enough, but I've traded hundreds. And uh, what I'm not willing to do uh, is to trade something that is too much different than the, the you know, the, than the systems that, the trend following systems that have those great characteristics of um, positive skew. And um, so I'm not, so even with the systems that 
I trade four or 400, uh, they're going to be pretty similar. And as I've said before, they, um, their biggest uh, advantage of trading multiple breakout systems is that on the big trades, you were, you're going to get some diversification on the exits. And uh, that's pretty much it. Some of these breakout entries, they all occur on the same day. Whether it's four or 40 systems, you know, the breakouts and some of these things, they just occur on the same day. So do a better job and with your entries, Jerry. No, I'm okay, maybe, but I'm trading so many markets that I'm, I'm not going to be too concerned about getting in all of my crude on the same day because it doesn't happen all the time or that often. <clears throat> but I just think with, with uh, I'm all for as many systems as possible, but I'm not going to add crap to my overall system. I'm not going to add things with negative skew that um, we've tried to do that over the years. I was uh, trained by them saying that it's okay to trade systems that lose money, but they may do well in periods where the trend following does poorly. And so we looked at that, you know, we, we could easily find systems that weren't that great overall over all the data. And then we said, okay, what's the implication here? Well, in order to get meaningful diversification, you're going to have to trade this worse system um, larger than you probably want to. It's not going to do nearly as well as the trend following systems. So it's going to help you with these drawdowns. And we were like, screw it. We don't care about these drawdowns. Um, trend following drawdowns don't correlate into uh, real world risk. I, I think it's definitely possible to have a system that if you dug into the numbers, not superficially from a performance table, but if you dug down deep into the numbers, you could see that it at the same time achieved um, the lowest risk of ruin humanly possible and had very large drawdowns. I think those two things can exist at the same time. And because they can, uh, that's why I'm not going to pay any attention to volatility-based risk measurements. Jerry, just quickly, um, in the Australian news tonight, they're talking about the massive rise in the price of eggs in the U.S. And I'm wondering, how's your, uh, how's your egg company doing? Egg company, egg company, Calm, C-A-L-M, is the symbol. It's doing pretty well. It's pretty choppy. Um, and, you know, this is another situation of where when I've monitored these commodity-related stocks and compared them to the, um, you know, commodity prices, pure commodity prices, be it cash or futures, you know, there can be big differences. Sometimes the stock will overperform. Um, the lumber companies did much better than lumber. Even though lumber was a big trade, it kind of collapsed and the lumber companies kind of kept going. Um, shipping futures collapsed, but the, some of the shipping companies uh, are still in monster uptrends. And so I think the eggs prices themselves have done better than the um, egg company. <clears throat> and it's a pure egg company. It's the, it's the biggest in the U.S. and it only does eggs. So there was as much um, purity there as I could find. However, I think my French fry company, Lamb Weston, has done better, although I don't have French fry. I don't have a French fry chart in front of me to see how it did as well, see if it did as well as um, French fries themselves. I don't go to McDonald's. Can I have a cake with that, Jerry? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm trying, to be, I'm trying to be a smart ass, but... Yeah, no, it's it's um, you know it's shocking how much fun um, trading stocks is. It is so much fun. I go down my list of 120 some stocks. I'm gonna max out soon at 150 and be done and be at 300. Um, <clears throat> you know, one of the things too is my people keep reminding me you're, we're way over 300 markets, <clears throat> and I say to them, yes. You were correct. And the reason I only say that we're not quite there is because I have put the stocks into two separate categories. And I want to see, I want to get some reaction to this. And um, the, the, it's, the first category is the long stocks. So it's single stocks that are going to be long. I take the short signals 
But because I have a restrictive filter on the shorts, I don't really do a lot of short equities in my long category. And, you know, in the category that can go long or short, they're almost all long, even because some of them are in downtrends, of course, but I don't take the short. So then I came up with another category of short only, and that would be indices and large companies, large mega cap companies. So I don't count both of those groups because when you count the currencies, you know, you, you're, you're, insinu- you're assuming that you're going to do longs and shorts and they're going to be about the same number. Well, in the stock sector, on the long, on, on the one group of stocks, they're going to be almost all the time long and not short. And then the short only sector, they're only going to be short, right? Because I've set them up as short only. So I've got small cap and mid cap that I'm going to go long, maybe do a few shorts. And then I've got the large cap, mega cap, and the indices that I'm going to only short. So I was thinking, I was really happy that I was adding, I came up with this idea that I can get on more shorts, I can find more possible short trades by extending my uh, into large companies that are highly diversified and kind of act like an index. It would not be very good as outliers on the upside. So I was combining you know, these companies with the indices. And I was, in fact, noticing that all of my index, short indexes, they're rallying like crazy. Like they're not even close to the lows any longer. And I've been getting out of them. However, some of these mega caps, they're hitting new lows. You know, there's way more of those than these indices. Okay. So then I remembered, you know, getting kind of permission from Richard to go back to doing this because I'd stop doing this strategy of long only and then short only. <clears throat> and, uh, but Richard months and months ago told me, yeah, he can see how that I could possibly do that. And one of the, uh, uh, and then Richard explained to me how, why he felt that was a good idea. And then recently, though, I sort of was thinking about that and I, I, I was able to understand it better. And the way I was understanding it is I think that what happens on these short indices is that you put these things on and then there is a, there is a lot of diversification inside this index. So the ATR can get really small because some of these stocks are in kind of an uptrend, some are in downtrend. So unlike an individual market that is just measuring the, you know, the volatility in that market, this index is really having the ATR is impacted by diversification. Some of the stocks are in uptrends, some in downtrends. Uh, and so you get this artificially low ATR, and then you sell this thing at the breakout and then if the market was to crash, like we've seen before, um, all of this diversification goes away and you get this monster sell-off in a, stock, in a market that has an artificially low ATR and because they're all now going one way, they're all getting crushed. The ones that are in uptrends are getting crushed, the ones in downtrends are getting crushed, and the ones that are flat are getting crushed. And so. I think that this kind of ball of wax can explode in some way, in a positive way, on the downside mostly. What do you think, Richard? I wish I could remember what we talked about so many months ago, Jerry. My my memory gets very foggy. But, yeah, look, I I tend to think that um, when we're trading, um, say, mega caps, the mega caps themselves as a business have used measures of diversification across their product lines, et cetera, to, to basically um, take away the advantage we get from trading them. Uh, so they've made it a, you know, a smoother um, performance curve of their business models because they're highly diversified. But when you're trading things like egg producers or you know, um, snowshoe producers or ski producers or bike producers and things like that there, um, I think they offer greater convexity. Um, so um, I think you can trade them both long and short, but I I tend to think that with the mega caps, you're, you're almost becoming an index in, a, in, a, in itself. And um, there is this inevitable bias in those indices towards the long side, which makes short trading sort of more problematic. But uh, yeah, I'm not sure, Jerry, because um, I still haven't got into individual stocks. I, I plan to one day, but uh, I've got enough on my plate at the moment. I mean, 
you know, this stock trading with the trend following approach, it seems to be the uncharted area at the moment. And, you know, when Jerry Parker is talking about the stock selection, it all makes uh, sense when someone else with 40 years of experience is talking. And of course, the, the next question is, how is the mere mortals are going to do it, isn't it? So, you know, like myself, this is my second year. So, so and I'm at the moment in the middle of um, adding single stocks into my portfolio. So what is going to be the approach? Uh, you know, how can a, a, a more, uh, I will say, an average uh, trader would actually use trend following approach to add the single stock? So that's is really a question uh, and which I am uh, going through a process. I think I find a process to deal with that. And the second question is, of course, how are you going to deal with the, the carry costs? Because, you know, these stocks are not going to be futures. You know, uh, there are possibly uh, stock futures in US, but, you know, uh, the majority of us will not be trading uh, single name stocks with the futures. So we will be paying interest. So how are we going to model the interest uh, for the, uh, in, in the, the cost side of the things? Because it is easy usually to model the commissions that you're going to pay. It's one-sided or two-sided. You can easily add that thing in. But the interest uh, may not be that simple because you know if you're trading Japanese yen and all the Aussie dollar and, and the euro and the US, and the, and the Swiss franc and the Swedish corona, oh my God. And, you know, really, uh, we are all coming back to the same thing that the back test is just going to be murky a little bit. Uh, and the, the last point is, you know, even with the single name stocks, you know, if I exclude uh, the shorting of it, I think the results uh, of the back test are better for 2022. And, uh, you know, Richard has mentioned that the indices have a, long-term bias okay um at the moment i am adding large caps so definitely large caps have a long bias as well so i can clearly uh i can clearly see that uh but adding a, a company you know uh it just throws me out to be honest i need to come up with a process to be able to add an egg company you know i i, I hear you I, I hear everyone else when they say that okay we're gonna add small and mid cap uh, stocks and equities into the portfolio so that the uh, opportunities to catch those outliers, these uh, super performance uh, stocks, uh, so to speak, are higher. Yeah, I would definitely agree. But what is that uh, process looks like is a question mark at the moment for me. Thanks a lot. Once again, I have a at least a two-step process where I choose stocks the same way I would choose uh, currencies, commodities, interest rate futures, and that is I trade as many as I can, and then I want to put in things that are going to be as diversified as possible, irrespective of their historical performance in any way, whether it's buy and hold or whether it's trend following the back test. I pay no attention to uh, whether I want to add a market. <clears throat> um, is it based upon how it's done in the past with my system or any system? It's strictly um, does it add diversification. So back in the day, I was told wheat sucks, but corn and beans are great. So I trade five wheats now, and they do. it still sucks. Uh, um, I trade um, a market that has never made money that people laugh about, cocoa, in, in the midst of what looks like a start of a big uptrend. Jerry, have you cut out? Yeah, I can't hear him either. I think he's fallen away. But uh, I'm wondering if Jerry uses um, any form of liquidity filter on his stock selection. Like, um, I'd be interested when he gets back if he if he does have any sort of um, liquidity filter applied, because I'm assuming that some of the small cap stocks, you know, the slippage on their low liquidity could be significant. Yes, I, I would agree, Richard. I think, I, you know, I, I don't know what Jerry Parker is doing, but I would guess a, a liquidity filter and be minimum share price. Uh, so let's say that maybe he's not trading less than $5, you know. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm just guessing, but it would make sense if you're doing this with a lot of money. So you need to be, um, I think it's just better risk management, no? Oh, so what happened was, is that um, I didn't know this, but 
in the midst of uh, me speaking, I had a phone call and I didn't answer it, but it, I guess it takes precedence over your, the microphone um, cuts off for the spaces. But uh, yeah, obviously you have a liquidity filter and um, you have a patient methodology on execution, all day VWAPs, and then your average holding period is a year. So it, I can uh, trade stocks that are fairly small and um, I mean, not too small, but you know, fairly small that give me amazing diversification and are very, very different. So I love trading these stocks. I don't pay any attention to how they've done in the, in the past, uh, nor, just like I wouldn't do uh, any, any futures market. I pay no attention. I love that Coco probably has lost money overall, but I'm still trading it. Wheat is another underperformer. I think I trade five different contracts of wheat. So I pride myself in paying attention only to philosophy and never really paying too much attention to a back test. Uh, hi, Jerry. I, I think I asked you this question a long time ago, but I don't remember the answer. Um, as you expand uh, the universe into with equities and with, with individual stocks, uh, are you attempting to keep your... Uh, risk allocation fixed between sectors like i don't know let's say quarter commodities quarter stocks quarter currencies quarter interest rates or um let's say if you trade 100 futures uh, which are commodities currencies and uh, uh commodities currencies and interest rates let's say you don't trade uh, equity futures so you have 100 100 futures and then if you had three 300 markets you trade 200 stocks would and if would you keep the bet size per trade equal across the 300 which means you will be 66 percent in stocks in terms of risk and and 33 percent in the rest of the futures or you try to normalize it so that you keep kind of equal exposure to sector over the whole portfolio well good question so I trade uh, 300 markets, 150 stocks. I'm almost there. I, you know, I can't put on some of these stocks because some of the ones I want to add to the portfolio are in big, massive uptrends. So I need to wait for them to kind of go flat. But the plan is 150 stocks, 300 total markets. And that just kind of um, probably is 50 markets each, 50 currencies, 50 um, commodities, and 50 interest rate futures and ETFs. <clears throat> so it's not quite, probably not exactly that. But I think that the philosophical point here is to trade all the markets with the same unit size. So all the stocks will have the same uh, unit size as the commodities. The 150 stocks will have the same unit size as each of the currencies, commodities, and interest rates. <clears throat> now, I'm not one necessarily to I have done it this way before where we say, no, let's start at a higher level and decide how much we, we want to have each sector balance the four sectors. Not a perfect way of doing it, but let's just, for argument's sake, say that there are four sectors and we want to impose 25% on each. So I don't think that that is uh, philosophically the right way to do it. Um, I think that we don't want to, you know, the CTAs, the trend following, the diversified outlier hunters, we have more diversification than anyone else, but we don't really care about the diversification as much as others do. Our, what we care about is the outlier, and we need to trade each one of these trades the same. And we can't build this portfolio, for instance, of 150 stocks if they're all going to be very similar stocks. So they are not very similar. So the reason that stocks get 50% of the portfolio is because they deserve 50% of the portfolio, because those 150 stocks in a way more, offer way more um, diversification than the 50 commodities do. And because I can cherry pick and choose the stocks I want to trade out of, let's say, four or 5,000, and I do not cherry pick on any of the other sectors, I trade them all, if possible. I trade all the commodities around the world 
there's like 55. I'm, I don't have uh, European electricity. There's a few I can't get my hands on. I trade every currency. You would be shocked at the currencies I trade. Every single one. I read these articles. I read newsletters of other large CTAs, and then they'll say, blah, 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 Chilean peso, blah, 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 Colombian peso. And I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. We don't trade Colombia. Let's get this on, the, on our trade sheet. So we put it on the trade sheet. So we're desperately trying to find all of these markets. It's just that there's so many stocks to choose from, and it's not a situation where you can say, oh, I'll trade them all, like the currencies and the commodities. No, we, can, we have to spend a massive amount of time going through, understanding what these companies do, uh, limiting it to smaller companies that can have these outliers or get bought, off, bought out. I have a handful of stocks that uh, are off the trade sheet recently because they got bought out. So that's a nice little benefit. Um, but you only put things on the trade sheet and you size things in sectors if they deserve it. And I think the stocks, there's more diversification in stocks than there are any other sector. And that has been very true over the past year or two where I have lots and lots of longs and shorts in the stocks, but I'm totally short interest rates. I'm totally long the dollar. And so with no diversification hardly whatsoever. So I think that's how you have to approach it versus, um, once again, do not kowtow to desiring uh, diversification uh, too much. You want to trade a lot of markets, but the reason you're trading a lot of markets is not only for a bit of diversification, but also for finding those outliers. And when you trade so many markets like I do, if you on purpose trade uh, too much energy or too much uh, of, of um, too many, um, let's say, steel stocks, it just really doesn't show up because each trade is just way too small. It doesn't have this impact. So if you could say to me, yeah, trading crude and unleaded, heating oil and uh, Brent and gas oil is obviously, I can prove to you that it's too much energy. My response would be, yeah, okay, then what happens if you adjust that on the back test to less energy? You're going to say it doesn't even move the dial. I don't even see it. Yeah, that's... That's the beauty of trading so many markets. But um, so this is uh, the correlation argument uh, or lack thereof um, is is that uh, in risk on environments correlations uh, go down, but in risk off environment all correlations globally go to one, and I'm talking all asset classes. And especially if in the asset class of equities, the correlation of all equities goes to, to one. So uh, are you concerned uh, about scenarios in which, I don't know, which happen once or twice every 10 years, let's say, uh, where, um, and then you, yeah, you may be actually desiring this because usually in a risk-off environment, that's where the outliers happen. But that's exactly... When, when the outliers happen and they all happen on those 150 stocks, which is half of your portfolio, so all outliers happen all in the same direction in half of your portfolio, um, which in one hand you will say, hey, I love it, I'm hunting them and they're here, so therefore I'm hunting them, but aren't you concerned about exposure in that kind of environments? Because that's when... 50% exposure to equities will uh, really show in terms of performance. Okay, so the answer to your question is yes. Um, however, however, it's a big however. Uh, I'm sorry, yes, yes. What was my question? <laughs> <laughs> your question is, um, aren't I concerned about having half the portfolio in stocks when we frequently can see all the, the correlation go to one and we can, and it's going to be a devastating drawdown. And we've seen this and no one was more pissed off than me when that very same thing happened in January, February of 2020 COVID. And I was up 9% for the year. And I was like within like two or three days, I was flat for the year. So yeah, I mean, absolutely. And, um, 
Okay, so I think this is, if you did uh, correlation and if you did um, portfolio construction perfectly, um, you define what perfect is, but I'm just going to stipulate you did it perfectly and no one did it better. You're still going to come in on some of those days and you're going to get your ass kicked because every single market is going to go down, not just the stocks. And that's exactly what happened in that January, February period of 2020. All the stocks, yes, they, they had a, they had a um, correlation of, of one and they all went down, but so did the currency, so did the commodities and so did the bonds. So we got crushed. Any type of diversification, the only thing that would have saved us was having shorts, and there was, and everything was in an uptrend. So this is why it's so critical to go through and try your best to choose, especially for me in this situation with trading 150 stocks out of 300 markets. Go in and try to find. You know, you must. The one of the the litmus test on do you have real diversification is. Uh, going in and seeing a lot of your stocks over time uh, be short when the S&P is in an uptrend and vice versa. So if you come in today, and if I was to say to you, I have more diversification in these stocks than I have in any of the other sectors, and you, and, but I had to admit that I was totally long all the stocks, then that would absolutely not be true. So the bottom line is that we do the best we can. We, we do it as scientifically as we can. We pay attention uh, to these broad rules and principles, and yet we still are going to be subject to things happening that, we, that um, are going to happen. And that's why it's so critical to, um, number one, trade small with your original, uh, your original risk budget being uh, something you can tolerate if everything goes against you. And then um, be ready to do a infrequent trade level cutback if you start having massive deterioration in your equity. And, that, and I think that's what we do. You know, we, we, we try to under trade a bit and then we're ready to pull the trigger. And then, of course, we don't, um, we don't increase our pro potential problem by using current AUM to size trades. Uh, Jerry, do we have a few couple minutes left to ask a question for Richard? Sure. Uh, so, Richard, I, I was thinking about uh, the discussion we were having at the beginning of the spaces, um, and I'm, I'm I'm really trying to um, want to understand because I'm worried that I may be missing some kind of deep wisdom that you have that I'm not aware of. So, I really want to understand. I you know, if it was just ego-based, I would have just left it. Okay, we disagree or whatever. But I want to dig a little deeper when you're, when you're using... Um, okay, so let's stick... I think the best way to clarify my confusion is let's stick with the $100 million uh, capital portfolio example. In, so you have a $100 million fund. You are diversified in as many markets as you... Can, can think of just maybe like Jerry. So Jerry pretty much trades all the markets that he wants to trade and diversified across markets, across systems. So I don't know, 300 markets you're trading and you're trading 20, mar 20 systems for each of those 300 markets for 6,000 market system pairs. And your, your ensemble is 6,000 market system pairs and you're diversified as, as diversified as you can possibly be. And now you're trading your strategies, right? With these systems and in these markets. Are you telling me that if you run a back test on these 300 markets and in this 6,000 market system ensemble over the last 20 years without compounding, so without compounding, so keeping trade size fixed across the 20 years, would you get an exponential equity curve? Okay. Yes, you would. And I'll explain it this way. Um, not only, it, so it, it, it can be explained two ways. At the moment, we're, you're having difficulty accepting my view that we get an exponentially rising equity curve, but I'll put it in a different way. I'll put it in a plot of a trade distribution or a portfolio distribution based on um, 
So uh, what I'll do, at, at the end of spaces, I'll put up this, this chart that will demonstrate it. So let's assume we've got an option of, um, let's say we've got a, a, a possible maximum diversification of 50 return streams. Now, let's assume that um, in our small capital limitation, we've only got the ability to um, select five of those markets from that possible 50. Plot the all the possible combinations you could possibly have of five within 50. And when you plot that distribution, you get a big dispersed scatter graph um, of of outcomes, which um, basically are dispersed throughout the chart. Now, what you say is, all right, now let's lift our level of diversification to 10 of those 50. And what you find is the, um, the scatter graph, we get another scatter graph, but it is much more concentrated and it shifts towards higher CAGR, the central mean of that scatter graph shifts toward higher CAGR. That's an interesting outcome I've found with trend following models. Now, when I go to a portfolio of 30 out of 50, and I plot that, I get a much more compressed scatter graph. And once again, CAGR gets shifted to a higher level with the central mean of that compressed scatter graph. So what that's telling me is that there is something that's happening, and this is peculiar to trend following models. And I've answered this, well, I've explained this in my rationale by saying, what is different towards, say, a convergent portfolio? And when you plot a convergent portfolio, you don't find the CAGR shifting to higher levels with increased diversification. You actually find CAGR shifting towards the mean of both all of the three distribution and it's centralizing within all of them. So something is shifting CAGR to the right. What is it? It's not, it's not capital. It's not um, bet size that's doing it. It's diversification that's doing it. And what's shifting the CAGR is that with that um, portfolio that progressively gets more and more diversified, you're actually getting more um, outliers in that portfolio distribution. That's what's shifting the CAGR to the right. Does that make sense? Um, okay. So in the cases where you're going from uh, five top tuplets to 10 tuplets to 30 tuplets, so out of the 50, First, you started with five, then you move to 10, then you move to combinations of 30 size portfolio. Um, are you keeping the bet size fixed per market? Yes. So a bet size is the same for all of them. The, so the okay. bet size is consistent. Okay. So uh, so whether you're counting for outliers or, or whatever else you're doing, my claim is that when you keep the bet size fixed and you're trading five markets, and then you keep the bet size fixed for 10 markets. And with the same bet size per market, you're trading 30 markets. I claim that you're using more capital. You're trading a bigger portfolio. And because you're trading more, more capital, a bigger portfolio, uh, the CAGR in terms of dollars per month or per year without compounding will have to increase. You're, yes, you are hunting yeah, I, more I see, outliers. I see where you're, you're coming from. I so see where you're coming you're from, but I, I disagree with it. Uh, and the reason I disagree you're with it is trading a that bigger portfolio. So you're making no, more dollars per month. No, it's not. Okay, so imagine this. Imagine this. Imagine that there was these outliers. So in hindsight, we know that these outliers existed in, in five markets out of a possible 20 markets. And let's say we have a portfolio of two markets chosen within those 20 markets. It's selection bias that's doing it. So the two markets out of the 20, there's a good chance there's so many combinations where those two markets have no outliers in them. However, as you're increasing the number, uh, your diversification, you are naturally going to include those two markets with those outliers in it as you progress up to a portfolio of 30. So in other words, the diversification 
it, the hunt for the outliers is naturally going to include those outliers as the diversification increases. This isn't, a, to me, this is not leverage. This is not position sizing. I know you're saying it's capital that's doing it, but I'm saying no, it's selection bias that's doing it. With small portfolios, there's a good chance you're missing out on those outliers because you don't know where or when they're going to occur um, within any particular market. But it's the selection bias that's actually doing it. I agree. Um, okay, there's just two things here that um, there's two things that I think uh, are 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 working on the what you're saying, the uplifting or the, the increases of Kagar. The the most dramatic and most important thing I think is the increase of capital. The second one is the benefit of diversification. So uh, and for for me for you to prove. For me to prove this to you, or if you can run this yourself, if you run the, the system with five markets out of the 30, then with 10 out of the 30, and then or out of the 50, I'm sorry, and then with 30 out of the 50, but normalize your trade size for the increase so that just like when Jerry or you increase markets, let's say you go from 100 to 200 markets, uh, you would kind of lower your bet size because if you want to keep your capital the same, doubling the number of markets you're trading for the same capital, you're increasing the heat in your portfolio by, by twice minus some, de some correlation benefits, some decorrelation benefits. So let's, but let's assume that markets are kind of relatively correlated or they're in the similar sector. If you're trading 100 markets and you now want to increase your portfolio to 200 markets, you wouldn't keep your bet size fixed. Just like you would trade hundred markets, you would well, very, you will be very well aware that you probably need double the capital to increase to two hundred, keeping the bet size fixed. So, in your tests, when you run your portfolio with five markets, same bet size, then ten markets, same bet size, then thirty markets, same bet size, you're increasing the, the you're increasing the risk and the heat on a constant capital. Or if you want to keep the heat and the risk fixed, you would have to increase capital. So the extra KGAR that you get is most of it, most of it. Some of it is from the benefit of diversification, but most that I would claim if you normalized, if you normalize the bet sizes to account for the increased number of markets, the KGAR would be similar, would be same. It's just that the fluctuations around that mean will be bigger will be bigger for smaller amount of markets and then it will be less for bigger amount of markets. So uh, the KGAR on the 10 market portfolio will be equal to the KGAR on the 30 market portfolio, but the 30 market portfolio would have small, better sharp and better return to risk uh, uh, ratio. Now, so, so but to, to make why the easiest way to, for me to make my point and without distracting from your explanation, I can see how in your process of diversifying and increasing, like if you start with a smaller account, which cannot trade 300 markets and 20 systems per market, which cannot trade an ensemble of 6,000 market system pairs, uh, such a small account, of course, as, as profits come, should increase their betting on more markets and more systems and, and whatever, as much as it goes. That's why I went to, to uh, an extreme of 100 million. So starting with an account that's big enough to trade all 300 markets and each, 20, and each of them with 20 systems each, the whole 6,000 ensemble. So here, we're, we're here, the equity curve, whether in backtest or in real life, if you keep your trading size fixed at 100 million and let's say risk, I don't know, 20 basis points per trade, Per, tr per trade, per system, or per ensemble, or whatever. If you keep it fixed at 100 million, there's no way you will get an exponential curve in backtest or in real life. The only way to get an exponential curve once you have maximized diversification across the 6,000 possible market system ensembles, your equity curve without compounding will be linear, whether you hunt outliers or not. 100%. Okay. Uh, I'm going to let Absolute have the last word. We'll pick it up next week. Thank you, everyone. Uh, go to battle on Twitter, but 
I need to move on.